Welcome back to this week's episode of The State of Recruiting, your weekly Horns 24-7 recruiting podcast. I'm Mike Roach, and I'm joined as always by Nick Harris. Uh, we are back for another big week. Uh, before we get into everything, Nick, how's it going? Uh, it's going pretty good, but uh, you're battling a flu game today. I, I told you pre-show sure you need to drop 40 right now. Yeah, it is the Jordan flu game for me. Had my booster shot and uh, feeling the after effects, and uh, that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna push through and uh, see what we can do here. Um, let's jump right into it. It was a big weekend for Texas on the uh, on the recruiting front. Um, didn't end up being a big week on the field as they lost their fifth straight and their second to Kansas. Then uh, in the time I've been in the business, they've lost two to Kansas, and that doesn't seem great. Um, but Still, we're able to host a number of big visitors on campus um, over the weekend. May, the main focus of that group was a large uh, group of, of elite offensive linemen that Texas is after. Uh, and I think that's kind of the headline of where we start. Let's start with Devon Campbell. Nobody has been a bigger target for Texas than Devon Campbell. I would probably argue that nobody's been higher on the board for longer than Devon Campbell. The uh, Arlington Bowie five-star offensive lineman uh, was offered when he was a sophomore. Shortly after his first game, uh, Texas has pursued him through two coaching staffs. They've kind of run the lead for him through that whole time now. I've told people that this reminds me of the Alfred Collins recruitment quite a bit because, like like with Col- like with uh, Campbell, Texas ran out in front for Collins for a while, but in the fall, other schools started to catch up, and that's kind of what's been happening here. Is Oklahoma and Alabama have been playing catch up this fall, but they've they've closed the gap a lot. So, um, coming off of the visit, you know, you, you always worry about a performance like that with a season like this, but. I think, and this will be a central theme for kind of what we talk about. There, the kids are are buying into the fact that they can be part of the solution, and that um, you know that they've got a belief in the coaching staff of moving forward. Those are the guys to fix the job. And so, I went to go see Devon yesterday, as we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, recording this on Wednesday. So I'm on Tuesday, and we had a long conversation. And um, you know, I, I think that he. He, you know, he opened up to me about as much as Devon will open up. Um, he's not a super open kid. I've known him for a while. And, um, you know, I think he does have a belief in Kyle Flood to be the one that, to develop him. Um, I think he does have a, a belief that Steve Sarkeesian the guy to get it turned around. And for him, it's almost weird because Bowie's going through the same type of thing Texas is. Bowie has a new coach this year and went two and eight because – they weren't getting a lot of buy-in from their seniors. So it's almost like he's seen it um, up close and personal. And I think because of that, Texas is still very much in the race here. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I like how you compare this to the Alfred Collins recruitment because uh, it's it's the kind of vibes I get. And for those that are, aren't familiar, Alfred Collins, you know, had Texas number one on his list for, you know, very, very much of his recruitment. Um, and it ended up extending his uh, decision date into February you know, it made a lot of people just kind of wonder, maybe is he looking for a reason not to go to Texas? But, you know, it ended up being Texas in the end. And ironically enough, it was Oklahoma and Alabama that were also trying to play catch up in that recruitment as well. Um, so it's eerily similar to what's going on here with Devon Campbell. Hopefully, you know, for Texas' sake, it ends up with the same result. Um, and, you know, after this weekend, I think that same result is, you know, uh, fair to predict. Um, you know, Kyle Flood has done a really good job of building that relationship since he's arrived at Texas. Um and he, that relationship even goes back to when he was recruiting him at Alabama. Uh, and that could, that could be the same for uh, Chris Gilbert. Um, you know, that's a relationship that he's had for much of his life uh, down in the, uh, in the South Dallas area. Uh, and now Chris Gilbert being on that Texas staff, it's been huge in recruiting Devon Campbell. So it's all the right pieces that have come together on this staff to help recruit Campbell, uh, with it being Sarkeesian, Flood, um, Gilbert, even Jeff Banks. Uh, it, it's, it's all kind of working out in Texas's favor. They're showing him that there's early playing time, even though that's maybe not necessarily something uh, that's very high on his board, but uh, there's also potential for development. Um, and, you know, Devon Campbell definitely wants to see that at the next level. He wants to be that first round, you know, draft pick that he has the potential of being. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens down the stretch, but, you know, as it sits right now, um, <clears throat> I like where Texas sits. Uh, we'll see if he ends up pushing it to the February uh, decision date. He does have that one last uh, official visit to use 
they could use it on LSU, Texas A&M, Georgia. Uh, those are kind of the three schools that we're hearing as far as, you know, that that um, that last visit being used. But uh, we'll see as it comes down the line. But, you know, as it sits right now, I like where my crystal ball sits. And, you know, Mike, you've done a good job here. I'm sure you like where uh, your crystal ball sits as well. I do. And, and you know, you mentioned kind of the timeline on, uh, for Devon. It, it doesn't seem like he even has a great idea. Like he, he said, it could go to February. It could I could announce it at the Under Armour game. I could announce it before that. It's just going to be um, when, when everything when everything uh, kind of comes together for him. So um, and, and like you said, the relationships have really come together here for Texas. They've got the most links, the most positive links to Campbell. Um, They've got a lot in their favor. Uh, the only thing they don't have in their favor is performance on the field. So we'll see how much that that ultimately factors in and the belief and development and all that. Um, let's move on to Cam Dewberry, a four-star offensive lineman from Atascacita, made his anticipated official visit uh, to Texas, his last official visit of the season. Um, and, you know, this is one where coming in, a lot of people at Texas, and even us, you know, you, we've covered this kid for five, four years. I mean, he was a freshman standout at Atascacita, so I've known him for four years. And even I, I don't think anybody had a great read on his recruitment, right? Like, he he goes places, they a lot of those schools get the momentum right after he visits there, uh, but nobody had a true read on the recruitment. And even at Texas, I think that they were like, we don't really know where we stand. So... Coming out of the trip, a lot of optimism. Um, a lot of that centers around the fact that, um, you know, they felt they did a really strong job on the visit. They, they feel that he's got a belief in the development of Kyle Flood. He certainly did not have that belief in Herb Hand. Um, and so they're a leg up there. And there is a sense, and if you've ever talked to Cam, you get the sense that he wants to be different. Um, he wants to do things differently than those around him. And so I think a lot of people expecting him to go to a school almost almost weighs against him. Um, and you could envision a scenario where he says, you know what, I want to go be part of this rebuild. Um, and so I think coming out of the visit, I'm not going to say Texas is in the lead. I'm not gonna, I think they, they acquitted themselves well, um, and I'll be interest, interested to see kind of how things play out in the next couple of weeks as it leads up to his December 15th decision. Yeah, I agree. This post-visit high is pretty high uh, for um, for Cam Dewberry right now. Obviously, Twitter has been kind of you know buzzing around his name, the hashtag Dewberry to Austin, the hashtag Untamed. Those have been things that have been thrown around by uh, uh, Brandon Harris and some of the commits. Um but, you know, Twitter buzz is not a commitment. Uh, so, you know, they're going to have to work down the stretch here in this last month to uh, really gain a leg up on Ohio State, Texas A&M, uh, and these contenders in this race. Even Oklahoma has become a legitimate contender in this race as well. Um, you know, so it's a crowded race. And, you know, at, at some point or another, every school that he's taken an official visit to, I feel like, has felt like they had to lead at one point or another. So it's going to be a weird one. Um and I think it, it could be a surprise on decision day. I, I, I feel like it could be something we may not even expect. Um, Cam Dewberry is just kind of one of those. But, um, you know, he's going to go to the place where he wants to be developed uh, for the next level. And he also wants to win. Um, so we'll see if uh, Texas is able to sell that vision to him and, and what can end up happening down the line. Uh, next, Allen offensive lineman, Nato Amazulu, who – if you're going to talk about tough reads, uh, I don't think it gets tougher than Neto. Um Texas was able to get him in on an official visit. I've heard mixed reactions on the visit, uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, but the one thing that I've heard that kind of stands out is that Neto did have a really, really positive meeting with Kyle Flood and, and the family. And so um, while I still think Texas probably has some work to do there, I think that they may have helped themselves a little bit just with that relationship with Flood. We'll really have to see because Neto is a kid that doesn't really open up He's, um, you know, been talking about shutting down the recruiting process since the spring, but doesn't seem any closer to it now than he was then. Um, and so it's going to be anybody's guess on what, what he does until he tells somebody something definitive. Yeah, I agree. I mean, this is probably one of the toughest reads that I've had since I've been, you know, here at Horns 24-7. Um, he's just, uh, when he talks to him, he's short. He keeps things close to his vest, and, you know, you can understand that. But um uh, as a result, that kind of makes our jobs a little bit difficult here and, and you know, trying to predict where he ends up. Um, I mean, we can look at the schools that he's taking visits to, the schools that he might take visits to. you got USC, uh, Texas, potentially Florida, um, 
And uh, you kind of look at the, the development of his younger brother, and maybe that helps you kind of, you know, uh, see the, um, the guide of where and NATO's recruitment is headed. Uh, his little brother, Zeno Mayozolu, uh, he's a 2024 edge who's already ranked in our top 100 uh, on 24-7 sports. And uh, Florida and Texas are kind of the similar schools that line up with NATO. Um, and those are kind of the similar schools that Zena has been taking visits to. So, you know, maybe there's a there's a you know connection there. But, you know, that's the only thing we can kind of look for in NATO's recruitment is any sort of uh, connection to grasp. At. But, um, you know, that positive conversation with Kyle Flood, we'll see how far that gets Texas uh, in this race. Um, and we don't even know if this is going to be a December or February decision. But, you know, if it's December, I kind of like where Texas sits just because he's only taken two visits. And if it ends up being that way up until he uh, uh, makes his decision on December 15th, then, you know, that could bode, bode well for Texas. But if it ends up getting extended out to February, they're obviously going to have to do a lot, uh, a lot more recruiting on him. But, you know, there's other options on the offensive line as well. So, you know, losing NATO wouldn't be the worst, but you definitely want to have a guy like that on the interior. Uh, next up, a quarterback from Draper, Utah's Corner Canyon, Devin Brown, was also on campus. Um, Devin doesn't talk a lot. He's had some, let's just say, poor experiences with the media um, that have caused him to kind of clam up a little bit. So we're having to rely on a lot of sourced information with Devin, but everything I've heard was phenomenal coming out of the trip. I think that that when you're a kid like Devin, you look at Texas and say, well, I like this offense. I like the way the offensive fit is. I think I could operate in this offense, especially if they get a couple more receivers and a couple more offensive linemen. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for me to come in in the spring and play immediately. I think that's probably what he saw. Um, he could come in and compete for that job. I don't think anybody's got that job nailed down. So um, for Texas, they've just got to outlast Ohio State, who has the last visit here. Um, if they are able to do that, I think um, I think there's a really good chance they walk away with Devin Brown. Yeah, Devin Brown's going to be an interesting one as well. Uh, you know, Blair Angulo, our, our a good friend out west, he did he was able to catch up with Devin um, after he got off of his visit, and he said good things about Texas. He had great things to say about Steve Sarkeesian. Um, obviously, that Ohio State visit looms large, and uh, Ole Miss obviously did a good job as well. Lane Kiffin has built a you know strong relationship in the short time that he's had. Um, so I think it's it's going to be a close battle between all three schools. Um, and it's it's if he chooses Texas, it's going to come down to does he want to be a part of this uh, you know new change or does he want to go ahead and enter into something where he'll win immediately. So I think that's kind of what it's going to come down to. Um, obviously, he has a great relationship with Steve Sarkeesian. Um, they they get along as far as offensive minds and, and similarly minded there. Um, but I also feel like you know if it ends up being a one quarterback class with Malik Murphy, I don't think it's the worst thing. In the no, not at all. Um, there were a lot of other visitors, and we recapped them all in the Stampede. You can go check that out at Horns 24-7. Uh, always go check out our work over there. The only other guy I want to mention here before we kind of move on is Kelvin Banks, the uh, five-star offensive tackle, the Oregon commit who did make it in for his unofficial visit. Um, I think, look, uh, there's not a lot coming out of the visit from him, and I think that's by design. He's not going to talk. In fact, he and I exchanged a couple of messages, and he just said, you know, he, he told me some things about the visit, but said, look, I don't really want to talk on the record about this, and that's fine. I'm not going to push him to. He, you know, he's in a in a position where I think he feels like the more he talks, you know, the more he's looked at as a uh, uh, decommit possibility, and I don't think he wants to be perceived as that. I think, again, if, if you're looking for the central theme, it's that that family believes Kyle Flood can develop and they see an opportunity for playing time. If that is enough to get Kelvin Banks to flip, then I think Texas is in a good position. It's just going to – what is it going to take to get him out of that de that commitment? And You know, somebody brought it up to me a couple of weeks ago with Kelvin is that he's already decommitted once when he committed early to Oklahoma State – decommitted, commits to Oregon. He doesn't really want to be a third commit guy. The only thing I think Texas is holding out hope for is he is a, uh, a very close to his mother. And I think the closer it gets and you're going as far away as Oregon, the more it starts to weigh on you. So I think for Texas, you know, if, if they got a hope here, it's that, you know, as it gets closer to him leaving, he just says, you know what, I don't want to go that far from mom and, and hopefully they're, you know, in position to win that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to touch on three more visitors really quick before we moved on. Uh, Larry Turner Gooden uh, made a, another return trip to Austin this past weekend. Uh, the uh, safety out for Bishop Alamania, Mission Hills, California, uh, in the North Los Angeles area. Um, I think this is a big visit that's kind of flying under the radar of some fans. Uh, being able to get him back on campus before he makes his decision is huge. This is the third time already he's been on campus since uh, the dead period opened on June 1st. And the second time since he's decommitted from Arizona State, he was in for the official visit uh, for the Oklahoma State game. And now he came back in uh, on his own, um, not with Malik Murphy. Uh, he came in on his own on an unofficial visit. So, you know, I like kind of where Texas is trending there. I think that's a really positive sign with, uh, you know, them potentially landing him. Um, also, uh, the uh, 2023 offensive guard, uh, Harris Sewell, was somebody that also made a very under-the-radar appearance at uh, Texas this past weekend. I think Texas is doing a really good job there. And if I had to point to probably the offensive lineman that I've been impressed with the most this year, uh, it, it was Harris Sewell. Um, you know, I think he's a big-time bruiser in the interior. He can play center. He can play guard. I think he could be a first-round pick at either position. So I think Texas is actually doing a pretty good job there. Um, and there was one more 2022, but here goes forgetful Nick again. I forgot who it was. Uh, um, hashtag forgetful Nick. Hashtag forgetful Nick. Back at it. Um, you said it was another 22. It was 23. another 22. Uh, Jalen Gilbo. Uh, Jalen Gilbo, uh, the uh, four-star corner, committed to TCU. Um, also made kind of an under the radar uh, appearance at the game this past weekend. If we look back, this whole entire visit weekend was just loaded. But going back to Gilbo. Um, you know, the TCU commit, getting him back on campus after Gary Patterson's firing, I think is huge for Texas uh, and possibly getting him back into the fold. You know, this is a guy that, you know, they definitely won in the fold. Obviously, there's been kind of a roller coaster in that recruitment, but, you know, there's still a desire on the Texas side to bring him in. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the the more Texas kind of chips away, I think the better chance they have. Um, Gilbo could hold out to see who TCU hires uh, at that position, uh, at the head coach position. Um, but, you know, again, if Texas keeps chipping away, I think they could flip that guy. I mean, if you want to talk about surprise 2022 visits, Nick Harold Perkins made the trip. Absolutely. I forgot about that as well. You know, that's big time. He came in with uh, Cam Dewberry um, and uh, just uh, was able to hang out for the game. Um, haven't been able to get much there, but we're working on it this week. Um, so, uh, you know, that's another one that's pretty intriguing, too. All right. Um, we're going to move on to our high school pick segment. Uh, before we do that, if you're listening on the podcast, we're going to to break. Uh, and throw it to some of our sponsors. If you are watching on YouTube, we are going to bring in our friend Guy Frazier right now. And there Hello, he is. It's How the great Guy Frazier. He's wearing a uh, Sporting Lovett Coronado today. He and I have matching shirts from uh, my trip to Lubbock. I brought him one as well. That's so, cute. Shouts to Coach Mann. Big game this week. Yeah, shout out to DJ Mann, who, uh, you know, Nick, that uh, – the, the people who like you, they'll do stuff for you. They'll give you shirts. So. That's family out there. You know? Yeah. Um, all right. So I wasn't really tracking scores last week, other than the big one that I was rubbing in both of your faces throughout the week to see how our picks were doing. And I still haven't like totally sat down and, and wrote them out, but I kind of like got back on Friday and was like, I don't know what my record was from last week, but I don't think it was good. Nick, do you have updates on our records from last week? I don't have updates, but y'all go ahead. I'll have them by the end of this segment. Okay. okay. I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think most of us had two losses of some sort. I'm curious. That's what I believe as well. I'm curious to see what Nick actually says, but I don't think it was pretty. Yeah. It. Um, you know what? I think if you if you'll just uh, just bear with me, let's. Uh, I think the big one, obviously, for y'all, the big loss, and then um, uh, it was a big win for me, was the uh, the DeSoto uh, Harker Heights, Harker Heights game. game. And that one, uh, I, I made it last week. That was about the easiest uh, easiest pick I've ever made. All right, all right. All right. Um, <laughs> that one really shocked me, just how much DeSoto was able to blow them out. I did not – I think if you – I talked to somebody after the game about this. I think if you run that game back ten times – that result only happens probably two out of the ten times. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, whoa. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you say that. If I'm, I'm talking like a blowout win. I, I, I'm not saying DeSoto only wins two out of the ten times. Right. I'm yeah. saying they only blow them out probably two out of ten. I'm going to run down the games from last week. So, DeCaney Willis, I believe Willis won that game. I think we all picked DeCaney. Yeah, right. that's exactly what happened. Um, so Nick start. Nick and Guy start out zero and two. I'm one and one. 
Uh, Port Arthur Memorial and Fort Ben Hightower. I think Port Arthur Memorial went down, correct? <laughs> Let me yeah, check. If that's the case, I'm 0 and 3 right now. Yeah, yeah, same. And me 1 and 2. Um, hold on, and hold then, on. Here we go. I'm pulling up Port Arthur Memorial right now. Um, Hightower did win that game 24 yeah. 21. And then, uh, we had, then we had Frisco, Roy City. We all picked Frisco, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I Nick think that was our double down game. Nick doubled on Frisco. Yeah. So that would make uh, make me I'm two and two, and, and Nick one and three. Two and three, because I two and three, know. two and three, and then Abernathy, Friona, Abernathy one, right? Yeah. So two and three for me. So three and two for me. Three and three for Nick. I picked Friona in that game. I oh, gonna oh, but I'm going to be honest, honest Nick. <laughs> so there we go. Rough week for week one, and it was around the state. A, a crazy week, a lot of upsets, a lot of big upsets. And, you know, for those who, like my dad, who hate that four teams get into the playoffs, I, hey, man, there were some big uh, four seeds dropping one seeds. How about, you know, uh, Nick's pick of uh, of uh, Fort Ben Marshall going down in, in round one? That was wild. The, one of the biggest upsets in the week last week. I think they were 33 point favorites over Barber Sill, something like that. Um, Barber Sill pulled off the shocker. So, was the round rock game another 1 4 or was that 2 3? That was a 1 4. Mm. Mm. Tough. Yeah. yeah. Tough. Yeah. Just don't go back and listen to last week's podcast. You're going to hear a lot of bad takes. Yeah, we listened to it on the way home. Guy and I listened to it on the way home right. from Frisco we, or from. Uh, Houston, because Guy was oh, clipping Nick picks to uh, put out on Twitter. He was just slaughtering me on the timeline. It was great. I think uh, I, I think because Nick and I listened to Tep and Step last night in the car when we were heading over to Carver Kimball for a little basketball action. Um, I think there was 26-4-1 upsets last uh, week, if I'm not mistaken. So that's close to like 10% of the games. Yeah. You know, so I think last week was a really bad week for the crowd that says that we don't need games like that. Um, yeah. That's a waste of time because it isn't a waste of time. You know, and there was plenty of two, three games that were really good as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good model for why 64 <laughs> football teams should be in a playoff bracket. Me and no, Mike need to agree on something. We're not, we're not going to go saying. there. We're not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. um, we don't have time for that in this podcast. <laughs> um, all right. Guy, what are our games for the week? Okay, so same rules as always for big school games. Uh, one small school, quote unquote. Um, our double down game is is somewhere down the line here. It's not within the first couple of options. I'll let y'all know when we get there. Uh, so here we go. Uh, Seven thirty p.m. Saturday night at Arlington's Globe Life Field, uh, where they're actually going to have five games there this weekend. So if you want some good football, head out there. Hold on. I was corrected by the guy who does credentials. It is Globe Life Park. Oh, yeah, I guess it is Globe Life Park. So they switched it to Globe Life Park. Oh, whoa, yeah. That's no, the old one was always Globe Life Field, I think, right? No, the old one was Globe Life Park. Yeah. Okay, well, now they're calling this one Globe Life Park, so. Oh, that's that's a bummer. The, the, the nickname does not yeah, factor in so anymore. The nickname on Tep and Step is the Gilf, which is yeah. uh, an interesting nickname. So. <laughs> Anyway, so um, back to 7.30 p.m. Saturday night. We've got the Midland Legacy Rebels heading all the way east. Uh, they're 9-1 and one this season, taking on the South Lake Carroll Dragons, who are undefeated at 11-0. Uh, Carroll enters this game as a 13-point favorite, according to DCTF Computer. Uh, big game in 6AD1 Region 1 uh, for the area round. The winner of this will play Louisville Arlington Martin winner next week. Um, I'll let you all take over. This one, um, and we'll talk a little bit about where I'll be this weekend. I will not be in Texas for the weekend, which is a massive bummer because I love the second round in Texas. And this game is everything like, you know, it's not necessarily for us. We don't have a lot of direct ties to it for Texas recruits. But this is one of those, I hope that gets thrown into a three-way at like, at a get a couple games I'm going to, and I'll just hang around and watch a great game. Um uh, we've talked about this a lot. Legacy, even go back to the summer, had a look of a team. You know, I think Step had said it was – they look like a DFW team getting off the bus. And they've obviously got a lot of great talent there. McKylan Young at running back, Chris Brazel at receiver, uh, Kenyon Moses on, at DB. They've got a ton to love. And I think 
this is this is a definite upset alert this week. And I'm not even sure. Like, I mean, this is a nine and one team versus an you know an eleven and zero team. I don't I don't know how much even big of an upset it would be. I'm not going to pick against South Lake. I think that Carroll has what it takes to do it, but man, it would not surprise me at all to look up Saturday night and see Legacy winning this game, even you know comfortably. Um, I'm going to go with South Lake just from the experience and guys on the field that have played deep playoff runs there for them. Uh, but man, Legacy is this is a uh, definite pitfall for South Lake on their road to state. Yeah, I really want to pick Legacy in this game, but the difference to me in this one is uh, the fact that Legacy dropped a heartbreaker to Arlington Martin, and South Lake Carroll handled Arlington Martin by, I think, 24 points earlier in the season. Um, and, you know, I'm a big common opponent guy, so, you know, looking at that, I, I see South Lake Carroll pulling this one out. But, again, if I, if I look up and see Legacy winning this game uh, while we're there, um, then I uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, Midland Legacy has not been scared of coming to the Dallas area and, pl- and playing in Arlington. Uh, they have back-to-back years. They've lost in Arlington in the playoffs back-to-back years. Uh, so, you know, they're going to come back with a vengeance. They have great talent. This is not your typical West Texas team. I think they're going to push South Lake Carroll to the, to the break. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm going to say it. I'm going to be kind of rude for Midland Legacy. I think it would be kind of a cool storyline if they win, but I got to pick South Lake Carroll. <laughs> Nick just hates the whole DFW area. Yeah, just I just for the underdog. I just if it was if it was uh if it was the other way around, you know, I'd be no, I'd be you don't, back. no, you don't, because Nick's Heath, just the lover of all teams. No, I am, I'm a lover no, of all teams. Because Heath is not going to be an underdog ever, and you're not going to root for any of the teams they're against. <laughs> um, Rockwall's hardly going to be an underdog. You're going to root for them. Uh, I, I think you still claim allegiance to Shadow Creek, though that seems like it's fading. Um, <laughs> You know, there's a half dozen Houston teams, East Texas teams. They're all situational. Well, 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 let's let's not tap into East Texas. I do have a lot of family ties out East, but, you know. Okay. Maybe we should do a show one day on my allegiances just so we know every, well, we know where we I stand. Here all, we could be here all day for that. <laughs> we could. Um, could, be, could be good off-season content. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, so – my heart fully says legacy here, but actually part of my, my brain and my head actually says legacy too. Um, with that said, that might be a little too gung ho. I, I think if, uh, you know, Marcus DeVia, who's the 2024 quarterback of legacy can kind of get things going uh, with the play action. I mean, they've got to establish a run game with, with McIlan on the ground. Uh, but Mar- Marcos is, is plenty uh, credible to get the ball down the field. It's just always a little bit of an accuracy thing on this intermediary stuff. So, you know, I don't know. They need him to be really sharp. They've got a really good front um, on offense and defense for that matter. Uh, 2022 defense alignment, Wesley Smith is a guy that I'm really big on. Not a guy for y'all, but he's just a good high school player. Uh, maybe like an FCS type guy. But so there, there's pieces there for Legacy to pull this off. But I do think South Lake Carroll in the end is probably the um, the better overall team, and probably the team that's that's really going to make a run here. And so I'm going to go with South Lake. I'm kind of with Nick. I'll probably be rooting for the Rebels on Saturday night. I'm just not sure it's going to happen in the end. So uh, I'll tell you that. Really but you give me hell. There. Well, look, Nick, I've got ties out there. You know, I've been I've been covering that program for a couple of years now. I'm joking. But uh <laughs> nah, yeah, I, I give you help and I'm probably with you on this. I'll one. tell you this. Had Harker Heights not burned you guys so badly, I think you would have been a lot more gung ho and picked oh, up. Oh, that's that's the other thing is this is a little bit of a gamesmanship pick. I can't get burned again. I'm already down two three after last week, so I gotta because- kind of be a little smart. Because it also, like, as much as it wouldn't surprise me, it also would not surprise me to look at the score Saturday and South Lake be up by four touchdowns. It, you know? it could happen. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're go, you're back to back going, what was I thinking? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if they can establish uh, the run game with quads and then Marcos can hit some big shots to Chris downfield, like, Legacy's got a chance. Um but, you know, I don't know. Owen Allen for South Lake, uh, another good running back in the state who's been averaging close to a first down a carry this year for like the third straight season. Like, they've got some workhorses for the Dragons, and I just think they might be the better overall, stronger team. They've played better comp uh, throughout the season, so that's probably the safer pick. But anyway, uh, South Lake for me, moving on to game number two. Uh, 7 p.m. Friday at Galena, yeah, it's at Galena Park's Galena Park ISD Stadium. 
the humble task to see the Eagles, who are nine and two, take on the Dickinson Gators, who are nine and two as well. Uh, a task to see is an eight-point favorite in this game, according to the DCTF computer. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, and while this is a couple years ago, it is kind of an interesting note. A task to see knocked out Dickinson uh, in the area around in 2019 as well. Um, so it's a big, uh, a little bit of a rematch game uh, in 6A D1 Region 3. Uh, the, the winner of this will play the winner of Cy Fair and Fort Bend Ridge Point next week. Uh, I'll let you fellas take over. This is a, this is an interesting game to me in the sense that these are two really strong teams that almost have like mirrored seasons a little bit. Um, Dickinson is a team that's just always loaded, and I always want to pick them further than I should probably. And so I'm going to, I'm going to regulate myself with that in mind. I've, I've ridden the Eagles a lot this year of Atascacita. Um, I, I really like what they've been able to put together. I think if, if there is a year for them to make a run, this could be it. Um, it's all going to come down to that young quarterback, Zion Brown, because I think that they've got everything built in around him. It's just, is this the guy that can make the plays when they need him to? Uh, it's funny, Dickinson's two two losses are to Katie and uh, uh, Ridge Point. You know, I was I was watching that game at the DCTF watch along early in the year, uh, the Ridge Point game, and then Atascacita's two losses are to Geyer and North Shore. So n- neither neither of those teams have two losses to to really cry about. Um, you know, those are both really four really tough teams. I think I'm just gonna I'm just gonna ride a task of Cena like I have been and uh, and hope the Eagles don't let me down. Uh, Dickinson is one of those programs in the Houston area that I have a halfway allegiance to. Um, big fan of the Gators down there, oh, chop chop. <laughs> um, but uh, looking at looking at a task of Cena season so far, um, whatever uh, Gavin Sessions went down at quarterback, kind of looked like you know a task of Cena's, you know momentum would be kind of stalled and that they maybe wouldn't make as deep of a run in the playoffs as expected uh but zion brown has come in the 2024 quarterback and he has picked up right where gavin left off he's and he does it in a different way he's really active uh, with his feet a true dual threat quarterback that um you know i don't think we've kind of seen aside from demetrius davis i don't think we've kind of seen like a speed threat type guy that we've seen from zion brown in the houston area in a while so um, I, I like Zion Brown. I think he has a lot of potential. Um, this is a big early test for him. Dickinson has a pretty good defense. Um, I'm going to pick Dickinson here. Uh, they played Katie really close, um, and Katie's going to be a state title contender 1,000%. They're probably going to be in that state championship. I think this is going to be a close game, and I think this is very well going to be a game that I can miss on. But I'm going to go ahead and take Dickinson. Yeah, so we've att- we've talked about Tascacita 900 gajillion times this year, and I've usually been pretty consistent that I've liked them most of the time. So I'm going to roll with them again here. Uh, Mike kind of touched on it, but Dickinson always has a, a ton of talent, and they always seem to fall relatively short early uh, in the playoffs. So I'm not familiar enough with that program to know why that happens. Um, I don't know if the talent's just not always in the right spots to make a run. Um but it always seems to be a common thing with them. So, and here's my other thing that I have a problem with Dickinson. They have a great color scheme, great mascot, but awesome they have some of the most underwhelming helmets and uniforms in the state. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to hold that against them. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to roll with the task Cena here just because uh, I've rolled with them a lot this year. And while I know Gavin Sessions went down, there's been some changes with that. Um, I'm still confident in the young gunslinger to, to come up big in this game at least and move them on to another week of football. So give me a task of Cito. Um, Moving on to game number three. It's a big one. Uh, 7 p.m. Friday at Tyler's Rose Stadium. Great venue. Uh, Nick and I made it out there earlier this year to see the renovations. Awesome place. Um, the College Station Cougars, who are 11-0, Take on the Frisco Lone Star Rangers, who are 9-2. and two. According to the DCTF computer, CSTAT enters this game as a six-point favorite. Uh, huge game in 5A D1 Region 2 uh, area round play. Uh, these are two teams that finished the AP poll in the top five, or finished in the AP poll in the top five. Uh, the winner of this plays the winner <coughs> of the Park in Frisco Wakeland next week. Um, I'll let you all take over. So... I usually stay pretty chalky 
and I usually pick the, the favorites. Um, I'm going to go against that this week. I, uh, with my close personal friend, Jeff Rayburn at the helm, Frisco Lone Star is a, that's a nasty team, man. And I, I know they're nine and two. They've got a, a, a close loss to Denton Ryan on their record. I mean, they're in, uh, in Highland Park too, right guys that they lost to Highland Park in the regular season. Alito. 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 That's right. So again, your two losses are to Alito and Denton Ryan. We talked a lot, guy, last week, and as we were accosted by several College Station Cougars in the <laughs> College Station Whataburger, um, who uh, one called me the Brian Peroni of Texas. Um, <laughs> I we just don't know what College Station has. You know, they're a team that it looks very good on paper. They 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 blow out everybody. They do everything they're supposed to do, um, but. They don't face as much competition as a team like Lone Star. Lone Star is a little more battle tested. It's all going to depend. Uh, and I think Lone Star also plays phenomenal defense. Um, this one, I may end up regretting this one, but I'm going to go with, uh, I'll go with Lone Star here. You know, I picked College Station to win the 5A Division One State Championship. So I think uh, we know where my pick is headed. Um, this is going to be oh, uh, such a big early test. We're going to learn a lot about, you know, how deep College Station can go in these playoffs in this game. If they are able to come out with a win, uh, we'll figure out very quickly how deep they can go. And man, this is just such a banger, especially in Tyler at Rose Stadium. Like, man, I wish there were some Texas targets in this game because I would be there. But uh, I'm going to take College Station. I think they pull out a squeaker. I think we'll see uh, really good defense on both sides. I think we can see a 21 20 type game. Uh, give me College Station. Yeah. So. This game is, is huge. I, th I think it's arguably top three, top five game in the state this weekend. And that's saying a lot because there's a lot of good games. Uh, and, and not to mention my ties to this game. Uh, the winner of this potentially plays my Scotties next week if, if Highland Park was the win on Friday. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a game that will tell us a lot about College Station, in my opinion. Could tell us a lot about Lone Star, too. Uh, you know, if College Station rolls in this game, and I mean, just Molly Wops Lone Star. That's really impressive. If they kind of play around and, and they get away with it and they squeak one by, I think that tells me a lot too. Because, um, you know, I, I've mentioned this before when that District 8 and 581 comes north, uh, in previous years, they've struggled, uh, which kind of brings me to my next point. So, College Station won state in 2017, they beat Alito in 58D2. Since then, they have struggled greatly in the area around. Um, in 2018, I've mentioned this game before, they lost to Highland Park down in Waco in a great game uh, to Chandler Morris and that group that won state. 2019, they turned around and played that great Marvin Mims Lone Star team, and they fell short again in the area around. And then last year, uh, the great Denton Ryan team that, that finally broke through and won state also beat them in the area round. So this has been a bugaboo a little bit for the kids. So I'm curious to see how they do. Um, when we got accosted last week, Mike, I thought it was interesting that uh, the, the little College Station Cougar that asked us questions, he, he asked us if we thought he, they were legit. Uh, so, I, you know, I wonder if they kind of have this in the back of their mind a little bit. What did y'all answer? <laughs> I said I thought they were legit. They've, they've showed no signs this year to think otherwise. But this will tell a lot this week. Um, with all that said, I think College Station will get over their area around home and and, and potentially play you know a, a huge matchup that you can guarantee I'll be at next week against Highland Park. So uh, we got to get there first. But I, I do think College Station revenge. will the area around game. Yeah, revenge, right? Um, so... <laughs> Give me the Cougars here, but I am curious to see how this one plays out. And I, and I guess it wouldn't surprise me if Lone Star gets by. Uh, you know, I think the only issue with Lone Star is their two greatest data points this year are losses. So, you know, I don't know how much I really want to back that at this point. But give me the Cougars uh, and we'll move on. Well, Game number four, I, go I, first of all, I should clarify. We said the kid was really nice who came he to was, talk to us he was at, at Waterbury. Yeah. He's the um, kicker there at uh, college. He did tell me he he did tell me that his youth leader told him that I never pick anybody <laughs> to go to a &M. Um and so I'm I'm the biggest Texas homer there is, and that doesn't sound much like a good youth leader to me. But the kid himself was very nice. <laughs> he was. Um, if College Station does make it, 
to uh, the third round, I will be there to rattle his cage. <laughs> and and on, not to mention, he he you know he opened up the conversation with his his one of his dreams is to be a recruiting writer and cover recruiting. So uh, good goals to have, and, and he was he was a cool kid, no doubt. Shouts to his youth leader. Yeah. Um, game number four, seven thirty p.m. Friday at uh, Waxahachie's Lumpkin Stadium, where Nick was a couple weeks ago. Oh, uh, I we said the wrong the, one. Huh? Sorry, Taylor threw the graphic up, and I just realized I sent her the wrong group of picks because we switched this game. Okay, well, that's Sorry, okay. we'll keep it rolling here. Um, that's hand up. That's on me. So the Ennis Lions, who are eleven and zero, uh, historically great program, will take on the Mansfield Timberview Wolves, who are seven and four. And they're scorching hot right now. Um, really fun game here. The DCTF computer actually has this as a true pick 'em game. They don't have uh, a lean either way. So uh, that's that's pretty cool for this time of the year. 5A D2 Region 2 area round game here. Uh, the winner of this will play Lovejoy Burleson winner. Um, and I guess one other thing to keep in mind is Ennis finished in the AP poll at number three. So great season for the Lions. Uh, and like I said, Timberview's scorching hot right now. Fun game of Waxahachie on Friday. I'll let y'all take over. Again, I usually go with the chalk. I usually go with the favorites. But maybe it was just seeing Timberview a couple weeks ago and what they did to Bur a pretty good Burleson team, uh, absolutely dismantling them. And Timberview is always one of those teams for me that is extremely dangerous come this time of year because they're well coached. They're big in the trenches. They play deep. They've got a lot of skill guys. And they, they're able to run the ball. Um, and so I think that, that that obviously matters. This is a revenge game for Ennis, who was knocked out of the playoffs last year um, by Timberview when Ennis was picked to, to possibly be a state championship contender. I, I, I don't know a ton about Ennis this year. I know that they've kind of been chugging along, uh, doing their thing, and, and still really good up front, still really good defensively. Uh, but I think Timberview is peaking at just the right time. They, they did this last year, made a run to the regional final or the – I think the regional final. Regional final, they lost to Lovejoy. Yeah, and 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 so I think um, I think I'm going to mm. pick those. It's a regional semifinal. I stand corrected. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think I am going to pick Timberview here to. Uh, I, I wouldn't like you said it's a pick 'em, so I'm not going to say it's going to shock in us, but uh, I, I've got Timberview. Um, this one's tough. This one's really tough. Uh, you know, Timberview started the season out pretty slow. Uh, had some bad losses early in the season. Um, but they've, uh, they've rebounded and played really well down the stretch. I mean, even a 14 point loss to Alito is, you know, a good data point that you can look back on just because of how strong Alito is. Um, uh, but I, I'm going to take the revenge factor in this game being that Ennis, you know, like Mike said, they had state title on their mind last year. And a lot of people thought they could make a run to that state title, me included. And, uh, Timberview shocked them in that second round. And then Timberview was the one that made, uh, you know, the run. Um, uh, so I'm going to take the Lions here. I think uh, Coach Harrell's squad is going to get them in the right mindset this week. I think a lot of those seniors are going to want to get uh, you know that this game back. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to take Ennis. Yeah, I'll keep this short. Uh, I think this Timberview team is really scary. I think they're one of the better four seeds in the state. Um, with no, they're all not that four. Said, they're not. Oh, they went end up being a three seed, weren't they? Yeah. 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 That's right. I guess Everman was the four seed out of that district. Yeah, so anyway, but with that said, for a team that struggled early in the year, they have definitely found their footing. Um, but I think Coach Harrell's a great motivator. He's had a lot of great teams at Ennis over the years in his two stints there. Um, and I think he's going to, he's gonna, you know, get the shit back on course in this game and get them to the next round. Probably, you know, where they could have been last year. I think they're going to get revenge here. I think the thing with Ennis is they have – we don't really know a ton about them from a prospect angle, but they have consistently been really good this year. They're 11-0 for a reason. They've beat two 6A uh, programs, including uh, the arch rival in Waxahachie in the Battle of 287. Years past, that maybe wouldn't have mattered, except the Hatch made the playoffs this year. So they beat a 6A playoff team. That's pretty impressive for a 5A D2 team uh, to do that. So I'm going to roll with this year. I think it will be a really good game, but I think the Lions get revenge uh, from last year's round game and move on to next week to play some more football. 
Uh, so that'll finish it up for our big school games. We've got one more game oh. remaining. Go ahead. Was was that the double or is this next one? Oh, yeah, that was the double down, actually. So what do you all want to do there? I forgot Oof. to mention that. I, uh, I'm not going to double. I, yeah, Neither. I can't double right. my pick. Yeah, I can't yeah. double that pick. Yeah, you know, I'm just I'm – just, I'm going to go ahead and double. You're going to double? <laughs> yeah, just throw it down on me. Let's go. He's, he Let's go last. Listen his time is typically as much. So. Uh, the confidence is not there, but I'm still picking it. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, no, it, no it helped me last week. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Nick's doubling down. Mike and, and I are not doubling down this week. Um, okay, our small school game of the week. Um, Nick is actually going to be at this one, I believe, still. So uh, Nick can give us the insides here. Uh, 7 p.m. Thursday night at Waco's McLean Stadium in beautiful Waco, Texas, Mike. Um, the El Campo Ricebirds are a shanty town. On. <laughs> we'll take on the Linda, Lindale Eagles, who are seven and four. Uh, El Campo enters this game as a seven point favorite. Um, I think this is a, it may get overlooked a little bit, but like Timberview, Lindale is scorching hot. So this is a really monumental game in 4 AD1 area round. A lot of people have El Campo as their state champions. And Lindell may have something to say about that this week. So uh, the winner of this game plays the winner of West Columbia and Little Cypress Mauriceville next week. Um, that's all I got for you. I'll let you all take over. I feel really exposed this week. I've gone out on a limb for two picks that normally I wouldn't pick at those spots. Um, and I feel exposed in, the, in kind of just what you said, that I do have El Campo as a state uh, state qualifier. Uh, I think I had them a state champion. I don't know. I didn't pick that bracket all the way through, but I, I think I had them coming out of that region for sure. I'm going to go with El Campo. I believe Urban Owens he is the machine that that cannot be stopped. But they obviously they've got some warts on that team, um, and Lindale is is red hot. So I feel like uh, going out on a limb twice, and then a possible uh, what looks like a you know a, an easy upset pick here could lead me down. A hashtag down bad next week um but i'm gonna roll with el campo because i, I picked him to go that far so i gotta gotta stay with them here some of my earliest texas high school football memories as a young lad we're seeing lindell getting uh, the brake speed off of them by sulfur springs um uh, a couple of times throughout the 2004 2005 era so you know i'll hold lindell a little close this is uh, one of those east texas schools that i i have an allegiance to as well i used to live in lindell so um, I used to play on a little league baseball team that was called the Lindell Eagles as well. So, uh, all right, you know, all right, there's, all right. I have a jersey. This is different. This is a different kind of. Well, you have to prove it this much. <laughs> What's that really say? You know, that's a problem. Facts. Um, but I'm picking El Campo. Um, you know, Ruben Owens has been on a run. Uh, he's over 2,400 yards in 11 games this year. Um, and Lindell's defense hasn't been the best, even though they have been getting kind of hot lately. They've still been giving up quite a bit of points. Um, I think El Campo, you know, puts up more points than Lindell. I think it's going to be kind of like a 65-42 type game. Um, so uh, give me the Rice Birds. They're, they're really motivated this year. They lost in the area round last year against Kilgore in kind of an upset fashion, um, and, and they have stayed on their minds this year. I think they can get there as well. So uh, give me El Campo. Yeah, so, you know, this is a Lindale program that's been not only red hot currently, but for the last couple of seasons. This is a team that was a finalist last year that fell short to Argyle in the state championship for AD1. Uh, so they're not not used to big games. With that said, um, you know, last year when they had Jordan Jenkins, you could make the argument that they had the best player on the field. Uh, but he's actually at Baylor now, uh, which is where they'll be playing on Thursday. And so now the best player on the field is actually on El Campo's side with um, – now I'm drawing blanks, forgetful guy. Ruben Owens, geez. Um, so because of Ruben, and I think he's one of the best players in the state, and Nick has also given me some insider material on, hey, it's not just Ruben down there with the Rice Birds. They've got other guys too. Uh, I think El Campo is going to win this game. Uh, I think it could be a good game, but it wouldn't surprise me if maybe El Campo also pulls away a little bit in this one too uh, and, and kind of puts their foot down and shows the state that, no, we really are the real deal and, and this is a legit run we're about to make. So uh, give me Ruben Owens and the El Campo Ricebirds elite mascot, and that will cap off our picks for the week. Ricky Ricebirds right. could be a happy man on Thursday night. 
<laughs> I do. I need to go talk to uh, our good friends out there on the old Campo coaching staff. I need a Ricky Riceberg shirt. Uh, yeah. That is an, that's an incredible logo. Mm -hmm. um, the, all right. The statue they have down there. The whole scene is just cool. Yeah. So we'll talk about that here in a second uh, because Nick was out there this week. So let's uh, let's jump right into that. Nick, why don't you tell us about your week? Yeah, absolutely. On Thursday night, went down with uh, <laughs> to uh, Wharton County to check out El Campo and Houston Yates. Um, not necessarily a good game that I could find in round one, but just kind of an interesting uh, matchup because of guys that are on both sides in round one. Uh, was able to see Ruben Owens, of course. He had 11 carries for 205 yards and three touchdowns. So he was just – he was Ruben Owens uh, on Thursday night, and he checked out uh, at halftime. Uh, he didn't even play in the second half. So uh, that just kind of shows you how, how much they were able to, uh, you know, put their uh, foot on the gas pedal. Um, so he was he was really impressive. D.K. Ward is a safety at El Campo in 2022 that I think is an FBS talent but um, has zero offers anywhere, uh, you know, D2, NIA, NAIA. He wants any opportunity he can get. So if you're a recruiting coordinator out there listening to this, uh, check out D.K. Ward out of El Campo 2022 safety. Um, he was impressive. Then on the other side, uh, 2023 edge Cam Beiser uh, at Houston Yates. He was somebody that was actually at Texas this past weekend, just uh, uh, meeting the coaching staff and getting a game day experience. He's an interesting type kid. I think he has a, uh, you know, P5 potential. Um, we'll see how how close he gets to reaching that. Um, he was really impressive. He had a forced fumble in the first half on a huge hit. It's actually back on my Twitter if you want to go back and look at it. Um, and then as well for Houston Yates, the uh, UNLV commit at receiver Randy Masters. Um, he uh, uh, he was pretty impressive as well. Um, really good route running. He's kind of a good redemption story. Um, talk to him after the game. He's somebody that kind of got in trouble early in his career. And now he's kind of bounced back and is at Houston Yates and is becoming a leader. And it was really cool just to kind of see his progression as a leader and, and as a human. Um, really excited to see where Randy Masters ends up. Uh, and then on Friday, um, here goes Forgetful Nick again. Where was I? <laughs> where was I? I got to go back. You were, at, you were at Louisville and That's uh, right. McKinney Boyd. McKinney Boyd. Right. I probably forgot it because I only had about a five-minute drive down the street to go see it. Um, it was Louisville and McKinney Boyd. I uh, went to go check in with uh, a 2022 four-star wide receiver commit, Armani Winfield and, and Louisville. Um, it was a really good game, actually. McKinney Boyd is a really scrappy team uh, who just was able to put, you know, some pretty big drives together. They actually had one big play. Uh, they gave them the lead in the first half. Really good defense. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed watching Boyd, but uh, Louisville came out on top 27 to 17. They uh, got a couple late stops and uh, was able to score late to, to pull away. Um you know, Armani Winfield was was pretty good. Um, it wasn't the best game he's had all season, but you know, he was he he, sh he flashed at times. Um, had a really good comeback route in the second quarter that pretty and that impressed me. It was about a 16, 17 yard game. Um, you know, that was something I think that you know Texas coaches definitely want right now. So uh, you know, he was impressive to see, and um, you know, I was able to catch up with him after the game. You can go back at Horns twenty four seven to to see what we talked about. But uh, that was my week. Yeah, and up note with Armani. Um, you know, Michigan State has been a big-time player there. Um, as we are recording this, I believe news is broken that Mel Tucker has signed his extension uh, with Michigan State. That's only going to make their push for our money windfield uh, much tougher. So, um, Guy, we, we could just kind of ping-pong each other, off each other here since yeah. we kind of did the same thing last week. Um, we'll start with Thursday night uh, in Dallas at Kincaid Stadium. We watched uh, Everman take on South Oak Cliff. A game in which I think everybody thought maybe South Oak Cliff was going to run away with, and they were in a dogfight at the half. Um, ended up running away with it in the second half, but uh, I thought Everman put up a really good performance. Uh, the guys that stood out to me, Javon Thomas, the, the 2023 DB at SOC, it was incredible. Uh, he uh, played really physically, had an interception, a couple big hits. I think he's a guy, he just got cleared by the UIL to come and play. So mm -hmm. was itching to get on the field and, and really made an impression once he did. Um, and then also, uh, I'll let you go on on some of those lesser known guys on SOC, but um, I thought uh, I thought it would also be good to, to mention uh, some of their offensive linemen. They've got, I think that's the difference with SOC this year is they've got an offensive line that looks put together that can that really do some things for them. Yeah, so the offensive line is um, – I've always said in the past, the, the thing that kind of holds Sock back is their offensive line has been big but not always the most athletic um, and, and therefore not able to move guys and get to the next levels of the defense. 
this team's totally different. They, they've got some size, um, but they're athletic and they're able to move a lot better than they have in the past, and, and therefore they're just more effective. They're not just big bodies. Uh, and because of that, they're able to protect guys like Kevin Jennings, who's the 2022 quarterback at SOC, uh, who was not great through the air last week, but got the job done um, on the ground and was able to score, I think, two or three scores. And um, he's had an, uh, seen an uptick in his recruitment lately as his cycle kind of finishes here. Uh, he went ahead and decided to commit to Missouri State, um, I believe, on Monday. So uh, congrats to Kevin there. Well-deserved, long time coming. Uh, and just been a really good, uh, calm influence on that offense there at Sock, and I think it will be really important for them going forward. Uh, Randy Reese showed flashes as well, who's a 2023 receiver that I'm a really big fan of, good route runner. Uh, but I'll kind of piggyback, piggyback off of Mike. Um, Javon Thomas was incredible last week, and I mentioned him because that's the first time I've got to see him in person uh, because the last time I saw Sock, he was not cleared yet to play. Um, and the one thing that stood out to me was his physical presence on the perimeter of their defense. He wasn't just hitting guys. He was finishing through on tackles, uh, showed an ability to recover and have a couple pass breakups and was just constantly around the football. So uh, really good returns on him for the first time actually getting to see him in pads. Um, and I'm drawing blanks, Mike, on the 2023 offensive lineman that we like over there that just transferred over uh, from Randall. Naredo uh, they- Stoker. Yeah, Big Mike. That's him. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> to see how he progresses. Uh, he had some moments last week, and he's going to be a guy that they're going to need to really step up during this playoff run that they're looking to make. Uh, so, yeah, Sock got pushed, but like good teams, um, they kind of woke up. And it's like you said, Mike, they, they got punched in the mouth. And like a good boxer, you know, they kind of wake up once they get a little blood tasted and, uh, you know, on their tongue and get rolling. And once they did, I think they – one on a 28-0 run to finish the game. So, yeah, uh, they, they showed their muscles and did what they needed to do. It was well in hand once they started rolling. Um, Friday night, Guy and I made the trip to uh, Houston to Tomball ISD Memorial Stadium, I think it was called. Um, a really cool stadium design-wise. Uh, I think it's brand new. I, I yeah. think first year. First, first, first year. year, okay, yeah. It's a gorgeous stadium. There are some design flaws and some uh, – I think that they've still – they're not used to the media horde coming in, so I think uh, there's some processes their athletic department needs to work out. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I thought a really cool stadium. It looks a lot like Katie's Legacy Stadium, kind of built a little bit like C.H. Uh, Collins as well. Um, I, I just thought it was a, a really beautiful place to watch a game. Um, as uh, Klein Kane took on Cy Woods. That was a game, too, that like going into the half, you thought, well, Cy Woods is hanging on for dear life here, and they've done a couple things that's interesting. And then Klein Kane really just put the hammer down in the second half and took it to him. Um, Matthew Golden was who we were there to see. The Texas offer at wide receiver made a couple big plays, including an uh, acrobatic touchdown catch. Carson Rover, the Klein Kane quarterback, is a guy that I've, I've always been a fan of. I think he gets the ball out really quickly, throws it accurately, and he can really, you know, kind of drive it. Um, on the uh, the other side of the ball, Lakia Rawls at defensive tackle for uh, for Klein Kane and Air Force commit was unstoppable, pretty much unblockable. I called, I did the uh, color commentary for Texan Live in that game, and he was the guy singled out beforehand as, you know. Woods is going to have to figure out what to do with this guy or it's it's going to be a long night. And uh, it turns out they did not figure out what to do with him. So, uh, Guy, any takeaways you had from the game? Yeah, one of my takeaways, I didn't know who he was ahead of ahead of time, but I, I guess you did, was the Air Force commit and Lukia Rawls. There was a couple guys on their defensive line that was active early and often, uh, but he was by far the standout. And I, I don't know if, if his stats ended up being with, with sacks in the end, but he was – back there on quarterback running back exchanges and was disrupting plays for Cy Woods. Uh, so he stood out. And then, yeah, I mean, Matthew Golden was a little bit quiet. They, they struggled to get the ball to him and weren't always looking to do so early in the game. But there, there was a portion of third quarter where he heated up a little bit. Uh, I think they had to end the round to him where he had like a 20-yard run off of it. So they, they ended up finding ways to get him the ball one way or another. Uh, and then he had an incredible, you know, acrobatic uh, act on a, on a touchdown that kind of set the tone right before the halftime break. So 
while his stat line maybe wasn't the most impressive, he was effective enough in, a, in an important playoff game. Um, and great kid as well. Enjoyed meeting him after and getting to talk to him a little bit. One guy I wanted to highlight, Mike, and you're going to have to help me on the name here. Was it Philip White for Cy Woods, the little slot receiver that was just all over the place? Yeah, he, he was basically their entire offense. Yes, and he was really fun. I mean, probably 5'9", five, 5'10", five, if you like him. Um, not the biggest dude, but, yeah, they got the ball to him, and he made a lot of people look silly on that Klein Kane defense, especially in their secondary. Uh, our buddy Colin Kennedy and I enjoyed him quite a bit there in that game, uh, despite his side woods team falling short. So uh, another the, guy of note. He was the biggest slot receiver they had because the other slot was listed at five foot three, <laughs> yes. uh, one forty or something like that. Right. Um, all right, Nick, what do you got on tap for this week? Yeah, this week on uh, Thursday, um, there's not many Texas offers in action, so I'm going back to see El Campo and Lindale. Um, excited just to see uh, uh, that offense up against, you know, uh, a pretty good squad, uh, Lindale. You know, Lindale, we mentioned earlier, is a team that made it to the state championship last year. And it's a game at McLean Stadium. I will always find an excuse to go catch a game there. Uh, just a really cool venue to see a high school game at, or just a game period. Um, and then I might catch some uh, Shorty's Pizza Shack beforehand, courtesy of Guy Frazier. Um, solid lob if you're in the Waco area. You know, go, go grab you a pizza pillow. Um, this is not an ad. And some wings. And some wings. And some wings, for sure. Um, and then on Friday, I am uh, heading down to Galena Park ISD Stadium to see uh, Umbel Atascacita and Dickinson. Um, there to see Camp Dewberry uh, and new uh, Texas offer Nate Kibble on the offensive line for uh, uh, Tascacita. And then on the other side, as far as Texas offers goes, Vernon Glover, the 2023 corner, uh, who has made a couple trips to Texas, has shown a lot of early interest. Uh, I'm excited to finally see him in action for the first time uh, in pads. I've seen him in 7-on-7 seven seven a couple of times. But uh, excited to see him in pads, excited to see that game. And then on Saturday, I'm there for the triple header uh, at Globe Life I'm going to call it Globe Life Field. They, they scorned us about calling it Globe Life Park and Globe Life Field for so long, and now they want us to switch it. I'm not doing that. Um, the early game, 11 a.m., um, is Tyler Legacy and Cedar Hill. Tyler Legacy uh, obviously having the four-star running back commit to Marion Miller. Um, as crazy as it is, we could see Tyler Legacy in the third round. Uh, this is a very winnable game for Tyler Legacy. It's, I'm surprised you didn't throw this in our pickup guy. Uh, it's a very interesting one because neither of these teams, I feel like, would be in the third round any other year. But here we are. One of them is going to be. And then uh, the middle game, Rockwell and DeSoto. I'm just going to leave it at that. 7 th uh, 730 South Lake Carolyn, Midland Legacy. Uh, I'm excited for all three of those. You all right. That's fine. Yeah, go ahead, guy. Okay, so that Legacy Cedar Hill game is actually a pick on the corner of the DCTF computer. Uh, so that's kind of wild when you consider – I think Nick and I, you, we were at that game last year, correct? Uh, we were. It was at um, uh, Mesquite Memorial. Yeah. We got some wings over at my wing place in Garland. Before yeah, and Cedar Hill won 45-0. to zero. So um, potentially a big redemption spot for, for the legacy uh, boys out east. But anyway, so my schedule this week, Thursday night, I'll be with Mike over at Globe Life Park, Globe Life Field, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's their first game of the weekend there. As uh, South Oak Cliff and Frisco will, will go at each other, um, y'all know where I stand with sock and all that. But it'll, it'll be my first chance to see Cole Hudson play as well for Frisco, so really excited about that. And kind of my main reason for going to that game. Um, and then Friday night, uh, I'm going to go see my Scotties play Highland Park plays Frisco Wakeland up at Allen uh, Eagle Stadium, and. Again, y'all know where I stand with Highland Park, but my main purpose is to go see another Frisco offensive lineman with Wakeland's uh, 2023, Connor Stroh. Um, a guy that I actually got to see in camp action towards the end of the summer. And he's just a large human being that, that can move pretty well for his size. So, yeah, excited to see him against a pretty good defensive line that Highland Park will throw at him. And then Saturday, I'm with Nick for the triple header. Uh, you know, Tyler Legacy, Cedar Hill, DeSoto, Rockwall, and then Midland Legacy, South Lake Carroll. So five games this week. It'll be busy, but uh, like Mike and I have talked about before, that's why we love the area around. The second and the third round are just like buffets, right? And you get these triple headers, and uh, when they're right down the street from you, you can't pass that up. So really excited to get after it this week. I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous of you guys. Um, 
Thursday, yeah, Thursday I'll be at San Francisco. Uh, uh, transparency here, Guy had that game on the picks, and I asked him to take it off because that's just like that's like picking between children for me. Um, I, I love both those coaching staffs, both those teams. I just could couldn't do it. Um, Friday, I will be flying to Utah. I'm going to the, uh, I believe it is the UHSAA state championships at um, whatever they call that stadium the Utes play in, in Salt Lake. Um, <laughs> and uh, I will be seeing Devin Brown and the Corner Canyon. Uh, well, I don't even know the mascot. Corner Canyon versus Lone Peak um, in the state title game in Utah. want to go see Devin Brown and get a recap of his official visit. You know, Nick, somebody's got to take the sacrifices for this team. Somebody's got to get on a plane and go to Salt Lake and uh, go get the news while you guys get to have fun at a triple header all day Saturday. So, hey, if um, you had asked me to do it, I would have 1,000%. No, I, 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 it's a beautiful place. No, no, no. I'm joking. Like, uh, I obviously, it's it's hard to complain that I get to travel to Salt Lake and, and go <laughs> cover this game. I am, uh, you know, I'm just going to spend the weekend in Salt Lake. I was, there was a scenario where I covered the game Friday and flew back. Um, on uh, flew back on on Saturday morning, um, and and covered those games, but I'm not going to be able to make it. So, um, I, that's that's the schedule for this week. Um, I think uh, I think we will uh, be back with some interesting takes from the high school week uh, next week. And uh, obviously, it's Thanksgiving, so we're going to have to try to amend our uh, process a little bit, but uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, we want to thank everybody for listening. We want to thank everybody for playing along. Uh, guys, always thank you for coming on. Taylor, thank you for producing on the back end. Uh, for Nick Harris, Guy Frazier, I'm Mike Roach. We will see you guys next week.